Noah Raz is a vegan athlete. In 2022, he competed in a world championship triathlon in Abu Dhabi, coming 14th best in the world. In this episode, Noah and I go head to head debating the benefits of a carnivore versus a vegan diet. I really hope you enjoy. Hey Noah, it's awesome to have you on this podcast. How you been? Good, Brad. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, it's been a long time coming, but I'm, I'm excited to be here. It's amazing because not only are you an athlete, you're also a vegan athlete. I have this goal of being a pro athlete and nothing is going to stop me. And it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. At the moment, I've just got the next goal, doing well this summer in Australia and then next year going to Germany. Back in high school, I was a competitive state level swimmer. At this point, I hadn't swum in a very long time and I'm 22 now. My first few years after high school, I, you know, I didn't do a lot of activity. I got a bit overweight. Yeah, it was just not living a healthy lifestyle like I am today. When the Tokyo 2021 Olympic Games were on, I watched the triathlon and I was like, you know, oh, this, um, I just want to be a pro. I decided to get a coach. We came up with the goal of trying to represent Australia at the age group level. Abu Dhabi World Triathlon World Championships. I placed 14th in my age group out of, amazing. Uh, I think, 30 athletes. So I was wow. top half and I was going in there wanting a top 15 finish and I got that. So it was the hardest thing I've ever done. Standard distance triathlon is the same distance as they raced in the Olympic Games. It's a 1500 meter swim, 40 kilometer bike and a 10 kilometer run. It was so hot. The water was 30 degrees. Uh, the bike course was very fast and, and flat, but still um, towards the end, you started to feel the heat. And then as soon as I got off the bike onto the run, it was just survival. <laughs> the heat was getting to me and it was a mental battle to keep running. As soon as I got off the bike, I had a teammate that was spectating tell me, yeah, like you're 15th, like you're, you're in the top 15, chase them down. And so I, I knew in the back of my mind that I wanted to run the 10 Ks in under 40 minutes, mm. um, but my first few kilometers were over four minute Ks. And because of the conditions, I was like, you know, it doesn't matter. I've come halfway across the world. I'm going to give it my all. It was brutal. And I don't remember running down the finish line and then immediately collapsed over the line. And I had uh, the medical staff take me into the tent and they took my like core temperature and I was almost 40 degrees core wow. temperature. I was hypothermic and it took me about an hour to recover. You know, what I a story it. though. You must I be I, so proud of yourself. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm stoked. What does it feel like being a vegan athlete? Is it harder with your diet? Do you think there's no disadvantage on your behalf? Maybe you have to work harder to compensate given someone else on a diet that has perhaps more energy. What does it feel like to you as an athlete being vegan? Um, I don't think it's, it's not harder for me. It's the same. I've been a vegan for over a year now. There was a point in time where I was doing triathlon and I wasn't a vegan. So mm. I know both sides. And for me, I don't feel a difference. There are obviously benefits to being on an all plant-based diet and, and being an athlete as well. I had a very, you know, healthy way of eating even before I went vegan. So it wasn't like that much of a drastic shift for me. A lot of people, when they make a switch in their diet, no matter what it is, like whether they're going vegan or whether they're going pescatarian or even carnivore like yourself, a lot of the time they're feeling a massive difference because their body is changing to something completely radically different to what they're used to. And mm. for me, I already, already ate a lot of plant foods and it wasn't, so it wasn't like I felt like a difference like that. Someone like myself on a vegan diet or someone just eating an omnivorous diet would have an advantage over someone who's completely carnivore or keto. And why is that? The sport 
is so dependent on your ability to burn carbohydrate, especially in long distance events an Olympic distance triathlon, you will not be able to finish well if you don't take on carbohydrate during the race. I train with the race nutrition that I need to use in the race to, to train my gut to actually take on refined carbohydrate during, you know, the, the bout. Mm. Um, so, you know, training with gels, maple syrup, there's no competitive advantage to being a carnivore in an endurance sport, I would say. It's interesting you say that because a lot of carnival athletes that I follow talk about the advantage to being on ketosis. Sean Baker attributes his success breaking world records at 55. Mm. He says that he has more energy on an all meat diet. And a lot of athletes in the seventies and the eighties were on all meat diets. This is interesting. So there is this group in the endurance space. They're not completely keto or carnivore. But what they do is they either fast before low intensity at training sessions mm -hmm. or, and eat mainly keto. The idea is your body gets better at burning fat for fuel and therefore you will be able to sustain a longer period. That's of right. So from what I've heard, they eat not carnivore, but very low carb diet to the point where they're under ketosis. Like the, what they do is they actually have maybe a spoonful of honey and eat carbohydrates so that they're in glucosis and they burn all the carbohydrates and sugar. And by the time that's finished, then their body can revert back to ketosis and they're already used to it mm. because they've trained under ketosis. It is interesting. And I, I tried it a bit myself. And one of the things that we train as endurance athletes is the body's ability to burn fat better. Mm. Uh, because if, you, if you're a better fat burner, you've got a better diesel engine, basically. And, and yes, you're right. Like if you do train under ketosis and then take on the sugars while you're uh, racing, uh, you, yes, you, you have that diesel engine and then you're just topping up with like burts of carbs. You don't have that much of a risk of a GI spike and then a crash. Mm. That's during, right. During the race, it's which quite is very, it's, stagnant. Yeah, it's it's um, yeah, it is stagnant, which mm. is very advantageous. Yeah, but the even up to distances like an Ironman, which is the longest distance of triathlon, you still need to be able to burn the carbohydrate. The body takes so long to actually adapt to that type of training, and it can be risky for some type of people. And especially training as much as I do, if you're training faster or if you're training under ketosis, it puts a lot of strain on your body because you're just not as well fueled with carbohydrates for the session, which therefore means your recovery after the session is going to be slower and therefore it's going to impact the next few training sessions. What about someone like me who's been eating mainly carnivore? So I've been under ketosis for about six months now yeah. and i work out every day again i'm not an athlete but i i do pride my health to the point where i'm working out and always pushing my limits mm. if you stay on ketosis long enough surely you wouldn't have those adverse effects yeah look i don't know um i don't know if i'm the best person to answer that i would pose the question to you like if you did more cardio vascular exercise, like I'm talking long distance, long distance every day, mm. you know, in excess of 90 minutes, mm. two hours, three hours. Sometimes I'm doing like four hour rides, um, in that, um, scenario of a race mm. where I'm trying to go as hard as possible for as long as possible. It's physically not possible with, with, without carbohydrate. Look, I'm sure there aren't many carnivore endurance athletes. What sort of training do you do? Well, I, I don't do long distance. I just do weightlifting for about two hours to one hour a day. Yeah. And if I was doing long distance, I surely would actually have probably some honey and some fruits in the form of carbohydrates. And then mm. because my body is so used to ketosis, then I could burn all those carbohydrates and then end up in ketosis. Yeah. But it's interesting because like, what would you say about someone like Sean Baker, who is breaking these world records and he's completely carnivore? 
I think um, it's very it's it's fascinating, um, but um, not that hard to wrap my head around because the bout of energy that you need for weightlifting is purely anaerobic. The act of lifting a, a really heavy weight over a short period of time, you're going to be using uh, the phosphocreatine energy system within the muscles. So ATP, the universal source of energy for all animals, for all life on the planet, is adenosine triphosphate. And this yeah. molecule is in every cell in the body. The quickest way of producing ATP is through the phosphocreatine system. So where phosphocreatine in the muscle breaks apart and creates an energy release. And it is used in bouts of high intensity exercise under 10 seconds. So powerlifting, 100 meter sprinting, long jump, high jump, you know, you know, all, all that sort of like really explosive short intensity work, which, you know, someone like Sean Baker on a few purely carnivore diet, he's, he's, he's probably not getting any drawback from being on that, on that way of eating because all his body needs to use is the phosphocreatine to create the energy. Um, when he's training, I don't know, and that would probably come down to his ability to um, uh, burn fat. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to ask you a bit about, um, you know, how, when you decided to make that switch, like I remember watching, uh, like looking at one of your stories one day and it was just like going carnivore for health, I think you said. Like, yeah, the, the first that's thing. right. I wanted uh, to try it out. Yeah, and I was like, oh, that's, um, is he joking? Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so what, obviously, I, I've seen you, I saw your eczema in person like, mm. at the start of this year. Well, we, I came over and we recorded something together mm. and, um, and it was, it was bad. And like, firstly, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really happy to hear that. Like, um, as soon as I got on this zoom call, I noticed you, like, you just look like you're glowing and, uh, <laughs> maybe it's the light, yeah, but, maybe uh, it's the light down here, but, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, no, seriously, what a zoom filter? no, there's no zoom filter. <laughs> no, seriously. It, um, like you look like, you're really enjoying life and uh, I'm, I'm really happy for you, man. Cause Thank um, you. you know, uh, you, you, you didn't look too good. And uh, I'm, I'm not the type of person who will condemn someone for what they, you know, the, the, eth the ethical choices or, or whatever, you know, is giving you happiness and is giving you health in your life, then that's amazing. And um, it seems like meat has done that for you. It's funny because uh, the carnivore diet is is so vilified and is so opposite to the way people usually think that to start going on a carnivore diet just seems absolutely crazy. And to be honest, a year ago, if I was to tell myself that you're going to just eat meat every day and not just that, you're going to cure yourself doing it, it would just sound completely insane. So even growing up, like my parents would tell me, you know, don't eat meat because it causes cancer. And that's based on the wealth health organization statistics saying that if you eat hundred grams of meat every single day, then you're 17% more likely to die of cancer, but is actually based on epidemiological studies, which are unfounded, which have been proven recently as quote unquote shady science by all this new science is coming out that actually are based on clinical studies that actually prove that there is no link between cancer, colon cancer, atherosclerosis, clogging of the arteries, every single disease that people have preconceptions that meat gives you is just completely unfounded. I was reading this whole massive book by Paul Saladino, as well as all these other clinical studies, I'm reading this book right now, defending beef, which goes right into the health side of things. I've done enough research that I can safely say I am not concerned at all in terms of health. In fact, my health is literally, as you can see, better than it has been in my whole existence. And, and for the last six months, I've been really navigating 
a whole new life where I've never felt life with no eczema, virtually like 99% cured. That's something that's alien to me. And that's, that's something that the doctors say is impossible. And I've found that through meat. Yeah, it does sound completely crazy. And I know people might say I'm just one person, so you can't really speak on behalf of everyone, but there are actually thousands of people out there who have cured themselves with meat. And without a doubt, without like hesitation, I'm proud to say that meat cured me. Yeah. Your skin, the outside is a representation. Is a reflection of the inside. That's exactly right. So there was a point six months ago where I was in hospital and I was literally dying of sepsis unless I took these steroids, which they gave me. And I knew every time you take steroids, it heals within two weeks, but then it's back to normal once you're off it. So I knew like I have to find a solution. So I'm not worried health wise. There's so many clinical studies I could link and so many clinical studies I've done research on of why the carnivore diet is vilified, but actually healthy. But what I'm interested in now, now that I'm healthy, I'm more interested in the ethical sides of things now, because quite frequently I get these comments on my Instagram one of them's vegan who was my friend from high school he said you know you know it's great that you've healed yourself but what is the cost of your health on the world what's the carbon footprint that you're what about the 40 percent trees that you're deforesting in the amazon what about the 14.5 percent of greenhouse emissions so i i felt awful because of that obviously so i wanted to do my own research on what exactly is happening so before i get into it i'm curious what made you become a vegan? The majority reason of why I am, I am a vegan is environmental. Mm. And um, I think that uh, the impact that the, the animal agriculture world is having on, on the climate cannot be overlooked. And um, if, the, if the human race is going to save this planet, it, it has to sort out everything and it, it's, you know, carbon emissions by uh, burning fossil fuels is, is the biggest one. Um, but it's closely rivaled by, you know, you know, not just animal agriculture, all agriculture. And, and, and so there has to be uh, more sustainable and more educated people and, and around the world. And, and I, I think the best thing I can do um, to limit my carbon footprint is to be a vegan. And, um, you know, you save 10 times, uh, the carbon pr footprint on a plant-based diet, than you do driving an electric car. Mm. Um, but that being said, it, it does matter where you are getting your things from. And, and just like you, um, I know you're a big advocate of grass fed beef. That's right. And um, I am I am skeptical of the research that is for grass fed beef. In my opinion, the most sustainable um, animal farming is still not as as sustainable as the least sustainable plant agriculture. Have you heard of a biologist called Alan Savory? No, I haven't. He hated livestock. He hated cows and he hated farming because he blamed cows for the destruction and the deforestation of the forest and of land. And so what he did when he was in Africa was he removed all of the cows and he removed all of the animals. And it got to a point where the land was still desertified. And he was saying, why isn't this working? There was 40,000 elephants there roaming and he basically his direction triggered the government to shoot and eliminate 40,000 elephants in the name of protecting the land, thinking that it wouldn't be desertified, but it was still desertified. So now he's completely reversed his position. There's a fascinating Ted talk where he talks about, you know, the one way we can actually save the planet is actually using cattle. If you look at the Serengeti, there's thousands of wildebeest all roaming all the time, densely packed. There's thousands of them per square kilometer. Why is it that all of the land there is not desertified? It's actually because the cattle, the ruminant animals 
are aiding the land. The soon as you take the cows away, it becomes desertified. You actually need cows to sequester carbon into the soil. So they're actually, when you take away cows from the land, you literally desertify the land. And desertification obviously leads to more carbon dioxide being released into the atmosphere, tilling of the soil, all of like destroying the soil is what causes a lot of this greenhouse emissions. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I agree with you on that. And I, and I think um, uh, carbon is a currency and, and you're right. We, we need to lock away carbon to reduce the global temperature. When you take away the grazing animal, the land gets desertified. Mm. That's impossible to argue against. But what about the ecosystem that they displaced in the first in the first place? Well, that's a very interesting. Ancient years ago, what was that land used for? And it, it's about increasing biodiversity mm -hmm. and and the best way to do that is more species, mm. more species and more native species in that region. And cows are not a native species to the majority of the planet. Uh, yes, in places like the Serengeti, the cows are already there. There's wildebeest there. And for example, in America, before the Europeans settled there, like in early colonization, there, there was bison, there was millions of all of these buffalo just roaming the plains and the native Indians had a holistic relationship with them where they'd only take as much as they need. The majority of the agricultural land on the planet is used for animals that we eat and mm. to, to grow plants that feed those animals. And mm. what if we were to take a quarter of that land for, for us and grow plants that we can eat and return the rest to its natural state? Mm. Then you would start to see shifts and, and, and yes, there's a lot of work, other work to be done, but, um, I, I don't think it's, it's as simple as more cows equals lower global temperature, because you also have to factor in the, the methane expense and, um, a lot of methane doesn't last in the earth's atmosphere as long as carbon dioxide, but it's 10 times more greenhouse effective. So. Mm -hmm there's an easiest there's a there's an easy scenario right there of a quick way to lower the temperature is to remove the methane and and in in the next you know 30 years if you were to drastically limit the amount of cattle on the planet in the next 30 years you would start to see that radically drop and the temperature radically drop just by that um removal of methane from the atmosphere it's complicated well the thing about the methane in uh have you heard of regenerative agriculture yeah. yeah so this is this is like not just grass fed it's 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 a a way of practicing where it's holistic with nature and it's about encouraging biodiversity so for example with these cows that are on a regenerative agricultural farm when they yes they're producing methane but the thing is the amount of carbon that is sequestered into the soil versus the amount of carbon that is being released is actually negative 3.5 uh, pounds of carbon per pound of meat. So it's actually a sink. It's actually a carbon sink. That's why I brought up the point. If we actually stop emissions today, it won't be enough to bring it back to pre-industrial temperature. So we need sinks. We need carbon sinks at places that carbon can be sequestered back into the earth. We need to somehow get it back into the soil. The fastest way to do that is with cattle. Say factory farming is awful. I don't, I don't support that whatsoever, yeah. but yeah. in my own ethics, I believe by purchasing grass fed beef, yes, it's more expensive, but I'm supporting an industry that gives it, not only is it healthier, like there's all these facts to prove why basically eating grass oh, beef is like, like oh, yeah, it's, oh, a, it's oh, like, it's like an athlete yeah, versus yeah. Uh, animal that's all inflamed, but not, not only is it healthier to eat, but it's healthier for the planet. Again, if you remove cows completely, you lead to desertification. So you can't do that. I feel by supporting a meat industry that is grass fed, I'm actually not contributing to the destruction of the planet. In fact, it's actually leading to carbon sinks that are sequestering more carbon. It's good for the planet. It's good for uh, global warming. In terms of 
say the Amazon being deforested, 40% of the trees being cut down, a lot of that is being cut down because of soy and because of uh, grains that are being fed to the cows. Of course, I, I don't support that at all. I want the cows to be completely grass fed and 3% of that beef produced there is exported to countries like USA and Australia. So most of the meat is actually local. They're not being shipped from the Amazon where I agree. 40% of the trees are being cut down. That's awful. It's because of mismanagement and really it shouldn't be happening, but I'm not supporting that. My money is going to grass fed beef. That's local. Yeah. And, um, I, it's, it's hard to argue against the fact that grass fed beef is more sustainable than well, no, um, grass fed beef is more ethical and has a lower carbon footprint than uh, factory farmed beef. Mm. there's nothing wrong with with yourself eating that way but my concern is my concern is if a lot of the population decided to adopt grass-fed beef then you know that is taking up too much land extreme amount of land mm. it's hard to argue against the fact that it is not sustainable well, that's, that's another interesting point. Yes, grass-fed beef is perfect for the planet. Yes, it's reversing global warming. Yes, it's, it's healthier and it's more ethical. But the thing is, there's not enough land to support 7 billion, 8 billion people now on the earth. This is where regenerative agriculture comes in. Right now, there's 100,000 acres of land in America that is currently fallow. Have you heard of monocropped agriculture? Yeah. So a lot of the times when growing again this is not an attack on vegans or vegetarianism but a lot of the foods grown like corn wheat and rice it's monocropped so it's just one thing and so yeah. what happens is there's no diversity at all and the soil gets destroyed yeah you know so it's what you terrible. want it's you terrible. want yeah you want actually a balance as you were saying before you want balance between cows grazing on the surface sequestering carbon a whole mix of a biodiverse plants and animals. Monocropped agriculture has destroyed hundreds of thousands of acres in America. The only way you can rehabilitate that land is by putting cows on there. That's the only way and the fastest way to do it. And so it is we've... the fastest way to do it. But but the thing is the... So there's more than enough land there to is my point. There's more than enough land there to feed the whole of the US. And if every single country produces beef for themselves, so there would be enough yeah, well... to actually feed the whole planet. There's two arguments here. One is the ethicalness of the planet, global warming and how it impacts the planet. And the other one is the actual sentience of the animal. So I'm just like pushing this argument aside for now and just talking about global warming because sentience is a whole nother can of worms. Mm. If you choose to support grass fed beef and especially regenerative agriculture, I think there's no actual argument there to prove why it's ethically wrong beyond just the killing of an animal. Yes, look, um, well, the, the thing with that monocropped agriculture at the moment is most of it is, is food for factory farmed animals. Yeah, which again, I don't agree with. Which, which again, so, so it's all, it's a, it's a vicious cycle, you know? Yeah. You know, the, the more land is destroyed to grow more crops for more animals that are factory farmed, which then has a net, obviously, negative effect on you know, mm. biodiversity mm. and global warming mm. and deforestation, obviously. Mm. But and that doesn't mean stop eating meat completely. That means no, you I'm should, not, I'm should not choose I'm not to saying... eat grass fed and then that would be ethical and that wouldn't support the cutting down of 40% of trees in the name of grains and soy, right? In the next few years, there needs to be some, there needs to be some huge shift in the way that humans operate agriculture mm. and um of all of all respects and mm. you know i'm a vegan and you know one of the biggest causes of deforestation in the world is palm oil mm. and you know palm oil is vegan mm. but i don't i don't eat products that have palm oil in it because mm. the the absolute destruction that that monocropped agriculture has caused is just Devastating. It's devastating. And, and, mm. and you, and you look at timelines of satellite images of places like Borneo 
and it's it's really depressing to, mm. to, to see the amount of rainforest loss that has happened. That's right. I agree. At, at, for that. And it's, it's so, yeah, this is what I'm saying. There needs to be. Because it's easy profits. You know, if there was yeah. only factory farming and that was the only source of meat, I'd be very tempted to be vegan. As I said before, like I'm allergic to a lot of the protein that vegan diets need, but I'd be very ashamed to eat meat if the only source was factory farming. And you know, it hurts my wallet buying grass fed all the time because it's much <laughs> more expensive, but you know, ethically, I actually am environmentally concerned. I don't want to support an industry that supports factory farming. I think it's the worst, you know, there's thousands of tons of manure that should be a asset to actually helping the soil is now a liability because it's being dumped into rivers and mm -hmm. destroying shrimp populations and the fish you and all that, the ammonia you see that with the um, with factory farming and the hog farms, especially it's, yeah. um, yeah, that's, that's, that's yeah. yeah. If that was the only form of meat that I could consume, yeah, I'd be feeling very ashamed. But the thing is to support grass fed beef, you're actually supporting an industry where you're actually helping global warming. You're actually encouraging biodiversity. You're encouraging natural holistic being one with the land and helping the whole planet. Mm. So to me, at least from the research I've done, there's nothing ethically wrong beyond sacrificing an animal for your own consumption. Yeah. Yeah. Look, I think your the way you're going about it is to be commended because you genuinely want to help the planet. That's so, well, yeah. <laughs> it, it, um, and, and I, I would, I pity those who go about life. Who are apathetic. Who take for granted the, the plate, the planet that we live on. Mm -hmm. And no matter what you are, whether you're a vegan, whether you're a carnivore, whether you're a, you know, a farmer, whether you're a fisherman, I, I think that to, to be ignorant and, and go about life in a way that is detrimental to the planet. Um, and, and, and knowing that mm. as well, knowing that you're doing that, which is, you know, a lot of people will, a lot of people will look at a video of a cow being slaughtered and go, that's horrible. Mm. And then in four hours, they eat beef for dinner. Look, it's all good. If you, if you look at the cow and you could understand and you don't really get affected by that, but, but yeah, me is someone who, um, is very empathetic and has always loved animals, mm -hmm. um, and wildlife as well. I, um, I, I find it hard to eat, to have something on my plate that's been alive. Um, mm. uh, well, plants are alive, but. Yeah. You know what I mean? No, I, I know what you mean. And breathing and I'd love to touch on that. When I had organs for the first time, it's quite confronting in the <laughs> sense that when you eat meat, that's muscle meat, it's easy to uh, detach yourself from the fact that it's an animal that was once alive and living and breathing. And I think a lot of people in society, uh, yeah, they're aware that it was once alive, but they don't really like they're not great appreciate appreciated the holistically. Now that on their plate and they get yeah, to um, it. But by having a heart literally in front of me, you know, it looks like a human heart because it was a lamb heart. And I was thinking, wow, this is literally another life form that I'm eating. I'm not hugely religious, but by looking at this heart, I felt so appreciative of the fact that this animal died so that I could continue living in this beautiful cycle of life. Mm. You see, it's like the native Indians when they eat, they don't take any more than they need. They only take what they need and they respect the land. Yeah. You know, right now there's a third of all food being thrown into waste in America because there's such lack of regard. But for me, when I was looking at this heart, I said, you know, if these animals can have a good life, say they're grass fed, they're not in a factory farm, they're not being tortured. I'm sorry that you had to die. You are kind of living through me now in this beautiful natural cycle of birth and death and life. Just like what happens in the world with zebras being eaten by the lion, being eaten by whoever's high on the food chain. Yeah, of course, death is awful, but death is part of living and part of life. I think if you can be grateful, like that's why I think religion's a beautiful thing. Every time before they eat, they bless their food. 
in this world that we're currently in this modern society there's such a detachment from the food there's such a detachment to the point where we're wasting a third of all food and there's this disregard for even life yes yeah, so it's that's a very poignant point that you've made um we all live on this planet and that's right and um yeah in israel obviously a big part of you know, jewish religion is you bless the food before you eat every yeah day. Every meal, whether it's a snack, whether you're having a drink, even the smell of flowers as well. Mm. And um, it, it really struck with me. Like, I, I think that it, it, even myself, I'm, I'm guilty of it, you know, take, taking for granted what, what, I'm, what I'm eating, what I'm wearing as well. Like, mm. you know, who made this T-shirt? That's like, right. And um, I think if everyone can be more connected to that part of their life, then a lot of people will be happier as well. That's right. And, um, exactly right. To be more grateful. It's just, it comes down to gratitude, really. Being more grateful for what you have. Mm. We buy a lot of produce from the local market that's been, you know, grown by... Local farmers and local, local farmers as well. So, yeah, it, and, and that's the cycle that you need to support. And... Um, mm -hmm. and as well the, the food is better the food is fresher the, mm. it tastes better and i think yeah as i said before mm. everyone mm. would be happier if they're more connected that's it. right and i hate sounding preachy because i hate being one of those people but you know like your money literally dictates what's going to be alive financially in the next 10 years and so by choosing whether to invest your money say in grass-fed versus factory farming or or in local farmers versus industrial monocropped agriculture it really makes the difference mm, that's right yeah even though i'm like on the opposite end of the scale to you i mm. still i have the same belief that a lot of the way that western medicine treats illness mm. is so backwards yeah and it's and it's all about um uh curing uh, sorry it's all about band-aids what's about band-aids rather than yeah. preventing it the source. that's right and and, and that's and, exactly what i found in the eczema community yeah. every single medicine they give you it just transiently cures it. it it's great for about two weeks but as soon as you wean yourself off the medicine it comes back twice as worse it's just like getting addicted to drugs like recreational drugs like heroin you you take it you need a higher dose each time and that's exactly what happened to me so yeah basically with my diet i was already not eating fast food but like i was still eating chicken i was still eating rice i was still eating a lot of these traditional foods that are considered healthy especially like vegetables like i tried a um just a vegetarian diet for a while but i'm allergic to beans and i'm allergic to uh nuts and so a lot of the protein i actually can't eat i a lot of people say you know every single person has a unique key as a metaphor of what diet fits them the best and so yeah i, I even when i was trying like i didn't try it for long just a week but like i just didn't have enough protein getting getting in because i think uh, nuts and uh, beans are the supplements right for for protein yeah nuts beans uh yeah legumes a lot of people don't actually consider diet until their their health goes down the drain mm. you know especially like um which is which is ridiculous yeah i mean the foods out there that are given to us like fast foods and everything served in canola oil and vegetable oils which i i think is one of the highest causes of obesity all of this uh metabolic dysfunction and insulin resistance is a lot of it's caused by processed foods, processed foods uh, carbohydrates, yeah, yeah, sugar, and even some like grains, like white bread. Mm. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Are, are you, you know, you said you're confident in science about your diet, but are you concerned in the fact that your, you know, your gut isn't getting a diverse amount of food? different different foods yeah like, it's is a that, is that a concern for you? yeah it's it's interesting because people say you might get scurvy because you're not having enough vitamin c there's actually there's enough vitamin c in the organs i eat to sustain my diet in terms of foods that i might be missing out like say magnesium or calcium I do occasionally still have keto friendly 
fruit like avocado and coconuts that have the magnesium and the calcium in there. How do you eat the coconut? Do you just have the coconut like? Yeah, I was just just there. like one of those large white coconuts from the tropics, and I just cut it open, drink the milk and oh, the okay. the coconut water, and yeah. and just have the the skin. It's yeah. it's nice. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you you bring that up. There's there's something I wanted to ask you also. I looked up this study where it said actually 92% of all vegans have B12 deficiency, yeah, and that can common. lead to um, cardiac arrest. All right. Um, B12. Um, I have a supplement of um, vitamin B12, so it's like a sublingual um, spray uh, mm -hmm. that you spray under your tongue a few times a week. Um, and I also, from time to time, have a liquid plant-based iron supplement, which also has B, um, B12 in it. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I take care of those. Mm. Yeah. I was uh, in the gym. Someone came up to me, just like one of those freak moments of talking to someone. And he's noticed my eczema and he said to me, you know, I had eczema too. I, I went on carnival and it completely cured me. And I said, really? So I, he said, just start it. Just start it today. 30 days of just eating nothing but meat. Just try it. And so I started it instantly that day. But at the same time, 24 seven, I was looking up stories of people who cured themselves on the carnival diet. And I was finding so much, so much information. There's this group online called Zeroing In On Health. Um, I was, I was finding Sean Baker podcast, Michaela Peterson, who was a famous, very famous for curing herself of her rheumatoid arthritis through the yeah. carnival diet. Yeah. Just stories everywhere, not just of eczema, but of so many different autoimmune conditions that are completely cured. Crohn's disease, Parkinson's, and it was just uncanny. There's clinical studies, but it's not being talked about publicly. It's alternate medicine and people are skeptical of it, but I was willing to give it a go because I've already been through 20 years of traditional medicine, which completely screwed my life up. I'm on steroids for 20 years of my life. You should really be on it for only a year, but if you're on it for 20 years, it gets to the point where your body just can't take it anymore. You constantly need higher doses, higher potency so that, so that it can work because it stops working and then you're forced into withdrawal. Your body releases its own cortisol, but you're placing artificial cortisol in your skin and then it, your body can't produce its own. And then basically it erupted into three years of topical steroid withdrawal. So that's the traditional route. And I was just so phased by traditional medicine that I said, there has to be another solution out there. And I just kept looking and, and had this delusional quality about me where I said, there has to be an answer. I know there's an answer. So I just kept looking for three years, trying diets. I tried many things. Like I'm still doing cold water therapy every single day. I said, you know, most people can't cure themselves of this disease, but most people aren't willing to go to the edge and back and dive into freezing water every morning. And you know but what? I think that's a very underrated part of your story the cold water exposure i myself uh i don't live near the beach so it's a bit harder for me but um i do take cold showers and mm. um it it it's it's amazing mm -hmm. like um just even how you feel when you get out of the cold water is is the best feeling mm. it, and, and and yet there is so much, there's so much, much evidence, there's so much research behind the benefits of cold water exposure. And I think more people should be doing it. It's really, mm. it's hundred percent. It, 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 it can, it can be a game changer. Mm. Uh, I think for a lot of people and, and not only physically, but mentally, like the, the mental top down strength that you need every, every day to do that and is just going to help you in so many other ways in so that's many right. other areas of your life as well with stress management. With that's right. Being able to tolerate hard things. And, and, and when you do that to yourself every single day, it becomes a routine and it becomes ingrained in you. And so other things don't, you know, you don't bother you as much as, mm -hmm. as, as I just said, the stress management and mm -hmm. um, not to mention the benefits that cold water has on the, um, the immune system as well. Uh, you know, Wim Hof's a perfect example. That's right. Of, um, yeah. So 
yeah, I, I, I love that you're doing that. And, and that's yeah, yeah, a great. And I'd love to, I'd love to join you one day. Yeah, I'd love to, man. You know, uh, having said that, people might think, oh, probably the cold water therapy. Then it's probably he thinks it's the carnival diet, and it's not. It's just actually the cold water therapy that's doing the work. I started cold water therapy around September last year. I mean, yes, it's summer for a period of that time. But the thing is, I still had a lot of the eczema and yes, it helps immensely. But as you can see, just eating strawberries and reintroducing some, and again, it could be, it could be the fact that I haven't had strawberries in six months. And so it's, it's reacting because of that. But I find every time I deviate from the carnivore diet, which I, I, I want to in the future at the moment, my gut's very sensitive, but like, it, it really is not just the cold water therapy. It is the carnivore as well on top of it, because it's cured within five to seven weeks of being on this carnivore. It just accelerated so quickly. And I noticed the difference straight away. Again, I started September last year with cold water therapy and it's been great every single day, but within seven weeks of carnivore, I felt different. I started sleeping again. My skin started glowing. So yeah, I'm, I'm not. Um, discounting cold water therapy, but it's the combination of all four. I, I usually talk about it's the four things that I'm doing exercise. There's heaps of things, but really it's these main four. So exercise, saunas, saunas is a massive thing as well. Sweating out the toxins, cold water therapy, the carnivore, and of course, like sleep management, stress levels, water intake, which is a lot of things. And even sun, like vitamin D, uh, just Sunlight like in the morning. It, yeah. And, and I've got like these infrared panels, like red light therapy, which mimics like the sun's rays during the sunsets and uh, sunrise, which really help the skin. All right. Awesome. Noah, it's been amazing to have this conversation with you. I honestly thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm very grateful that we had this conversation and you yeah. could make some time and it was amazing. Thanks, Brad. Um, yeah, I appreciate that you wanted to get me on and have a chat. So yeah. Yeah. I hope you enjoy the conversation as much as yeah, I did. I, I certainly learned a lot and uh, hopefully yeah. you could see some, you know, different side of the, the yeah, fence. It's great. It's, it's actually, it's great to actually, you know, experience that and have a conversation with you about this because, um, mm. yeah, we, we probably do to see a lot of our own sides of the fence. So, yeah, I, I think we both obviously care very deeply for the planet and we come from different places but we still have that sense of care mm. you know uh, a lot of a lot of the times carnivores like myself are vilified as apathetic i don't care what happens but you know i, I really do care that's why i make the difference and try to buy grass fed and mm. and and care as much as i can we're well, yeah. doing a good thing <laughs> you too man awesome stuff At the Olympic Games, the marathon swim event, which is 10Ks, they do it in under two hours. Wow. Yeah, it's nuts. It's, That's crazy. It's, really, it's ridiculous. Like, to put it in perspective, I did my race in two hours and, uh, two hours and 11 minutes, which is considered really good, really mm. fast for, uh, well, 14th in the world for my age group. Um, but the elites do it in under an hour and 50 so say that again. You did it in two hours. Two hours and 11 minutes. 11 minutes. And the elites do an Olympic distance. One hour 50. Under, under that. That's amazing. Yeah. It's a different world to me. Like I can't imagine swimming for 1,500 meters. Like just <laughs> swimming to the X and the beach is challenging enough. Uh, but yeah, I really enjoy it. I, I love um, cooking, having the star of the meal not be uh, uh, meat. It opens up a whole world of, you know, different culinary opportunities.